French at Idri, uh, so contrary to French users, we begin on time our webinars. Uh, but I think that's always better because now our schedules are very much uh, uh, even tighter than before because of the possibilities that the Visio conference has offered us. Um, so again, I'm Sébastien Treyer, the director of Idri. I'm going to make a, just a few words of welcome in a few minutes from now. Uh, still waiting for the majority of the part of the audience to have been able to connect to the uh, to the webinar Thanks for those who are, who are on time for this webinar. Uh, good morning to all. Um, I see a colleague uh, uh, in the chat uh, writing in French. Um, I'm sorry to say the, uh, the webinar is going to be in English, and I don't think that we have pre foreseen a translation. So uh, I hope, Mustafa, that you're going to be able to uh, understand what we are saying in English. And in case you really want to ask a question and you can't ask it in, in English, we might be able to, uh, uh, to deal with that, but uh, uh, there is no translation. So maybe I'll just begin with my few words of, in, of a welcome, not introduction. I'm Sébastien Treyer, the director of IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations based in Paris. And, I really wanted to make a very short statement of welcome uh, for IDRI. It's a really important time. Uh, the report that you, we are going to be discussing is very important for a think tank like IDRI, who has been one of the think tanks contributing to uh, uh, trying to push in favor of the Paris Agreement and the way it has organized the governance of climate. So we feel committed. We have a responsibility to analyze the effect uh, of the Paris Agreement. It's extremely important in the run-up to uh, COP26, and it's particularly important to be both objective about what has not happened, but also seeing how we can catalyze action on things that have happened or that are happening. And that's really the type of responsibility that we feel we have as a, a, a member of the community of those who have pushed for the Paris Agreement to exist as it is. The second word of welcome that I would like to give you all is a welcome on behalf of the network, uh, particularly the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Network, whose collective effort it is that we are going to be discussing uh, this afternoon. Uh, the report by the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Network uh, uh, ahead of COP21 was, was uh, really centered on national decarbonization pathways, elaborated each pathway, discussed and elaborated by a national team. And I think that was something extremely important. Uh, an expert capacity that is really inscribed uh, in national economic situations, in political contexts, and that seems to us really a very necessary complement to the bottom-up approach of the Paris Agreement. And so that's really some of the products that we are discussing today is exactly the product of that type of architecture of knowledge to which uh, we are very pleased that uh, many of the speakers have accepted to participate and we are pleased at Idri to coordinate that network. That were my two words of welcome and I hand the word over, if I'm not mistaken, to my colleague Marta Torres. To Megan, we will... Um... Megan, please. If... Sorry. Uh, you... <laughs> no Hi, yes, I'm Megan Darby. I'm the editor of Climate Home News, and I'm very happy to have been invited to moderate here today. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, so Idri has for a long time been doing some serious work on deep decarbonisation, uh, what it looks like and what the conditions are to get there. Um, with this latest report, um, they, as, as Sebastian has already started to lay out, and Marta will lay out in more detail in a moment, um, they are really grappling with uh, how the um, 
action in different sectors influences um, the government targets and the government plans. Um, we know that the Paris Agreement was, is based on national commitments, uh, but those commitments do not happen in a vacuum. Uh, they are influenced by what the scientists say is necessary, but also what industries say is feasible and the public appetite for change. Um, so, uh, so this is a really ambitious report that's really just trying to um, gather together all these different trends and see how that they um, interact with each other um, to identify, uh, you know, where uh, that, that can unlock more ambition and where conversely there are, there are obstacles to change. Um, they've assembled a really great diverse knowledgeable set of speakers um, so uh, yeah very pleased to um, to, to be uh, involved and I'm sure I'm going to learn some things from this panel um, so the structure of the event is first of all Marta Torres from IDRI will outline um, the report introduce the report uh, then we have a panel of five contributors who represent different sectors and countries who, who uh, contributed to that report. And then we have a responding panel of four independent experts who were not involved in producing the report, um, but have knowledge of those themes and would like will, will comment on, um, you know, what they can take away from this um, uh, and what, um, you know, how it can apply to, um, to action uh, in, in the future. So uh, I believe most of some of the speakers have to rush off after speaking, but most of them are sticking around to the end um, when we will have a, a Q&A. Um, there is a, a Q&A box. Uh, you can enter, you can type in your questions at any time and please do. Uh, so in response and, and please say in your question if you would like if it to be addressed to a particular speaker. Um, and, and they will then be sort of filtered through to me uh, at the Q&A time. Um, there is also a chat box um, where you can talk amongst yourselves and um, if you want to share any links that you think are relevant to the discussion, um, please do so or, or any comments or thoughts as, as we go along. Uh, but any questions to the panel, please put in the Q&A box, not in the chat. Um, right, I think that's, that's all for housekeeping. So um, over to you, Marta. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I'm just opening. Yeah, if I just have a hands up to know whether the screen is shown. Yeah, thanks. And um, so thank you and um, good day to everyone. Um, so my name is Marta Torres. I work at IDRI at the climate team and I'm uh, um, the National Engagements Lead in the DDP Initiative. Um, for me, it is uh, really a, a, a honor to be able to, to introduce you today to this report that we're launching today, and to do this on behalf of, of the entire IDRI team and uh, my colleagues, Anna and Henry, who have also been at the heart of, heart of this report. Um, and what we wanted to share with you very quickly, just why, why we did that, why we were um, uh, convinced that, that we had to put efforts into this. And here you, you may know the DDP's this research collaboration is among um, 36 national research teams that since 2014 and uh, evolving in our analysis as well, we concerned to, to we exploring how um, economies and societies can transform by 2050 to achieve both the Paris Agreement long-term goals and national development priorities. And it is um, an obvious, well, it, it, it is a, a realization no, that we, we, um, we have today that I'm sure we share with everyone here that we are not in the right track for meeting the long-term Paris Agreement goals. And therefore, the question that drives um, us to do this is, is, is trying to answer how can we effectively inform increase of ambition? How can we make sure that, that um, we can structure conversations, we can have analysis that can allow, enable this increased ambition that we urgently need? And to do that, very particularly in the context of this cyclical process that the Paris Agreement has established. And to answer this question, we start with a, um, 
with a hypothesis of what we know from, from the scientific uh, assessments and framing uh, from the IPCC. We need three things. We need to look into systemic transformations and their enablers. So it's not sufficient to just look at the mission reductions, mitigation options, uh, emission, yeah, and mitigation options. We need to talk about what are those underlying transformations, how industries will evolve, how um, uh, mobility lifestyles will change, et cetera, and all these enablers that will make sure that these far-reaching and um, transformational changes happen. Second, um, we all know, and we've acknowledged for a long time now that um, local contexts matter a lot. So, it is imperative to reflect this heterogeneity and, and that we have to have it present when we're trying to um, promote higher ambition, um, promote the heterogeneity both you know, across countries, but also across different sectoral communities. Third, that we need to look at multiple dimensions and aspects of these transitions we know that it's not just a techno-economic challenge, that there are very important aspects, be social, be political, be of governance, that are necessary conditions also to push you know, these transitions and, and to be able to, um, to walk those paths. And these three principles with two views. One is, um, okay, uh, forward-looking. We need to understand what needs to happen. And that is the typical work that we would do on the DDP, um, the, the country-driven granular scenarios um, that can fit national debates. And again, not just scenarios, and I think here we share no, uh, the, uh, many other also communities of, of practice, also trying to apply those principles. So it's just not scenarios that um, look at mitigation options, but look and explain and derive um, transformational stories, uh, country-driven, and um, that feature other dimensions into these um, um, uh, pathways. And, and uh, take advantage um, um, maybe of here your attention to uh, want to, uh, we wanted to invite you this upcoming event on the 6th, 7th of October, where we will present this, uh, the latest results from the DDP focused on the large emerging economies. So this is forward-looking, all these roadmaps that tell us what, how we plan to do what we promise we will do. But then there's a second leg, leg and this is the backwards looking. And we think it's so important to understand how the change is happening and has happened in this first cycle of the Paris Agreement, because we are now closing this first cycle and we are preparing for the second one after Glasgow. So if we don't understand what has happened and why, or why not, and at what pace, um, um, we, uh, we, we need that knowledge to put it at the service no, of preparing this second round. And this backwards looking, is this is what this report is trying to do. Assessing the progress that we have had in this first cycle, looking beyond emission levels and targets um, with this bottom-up approach. And what you will find is all these country and sectoral stories told by um, the people in those countries that help us identifying this carbon transition maturity markers that we've set and hoops for increasing ambition. So very quickly, this is just what you can find once you click at the link and download the PDF. It's a report made with 70 authors, covers 26 countries, has three sectors, a follow, industry and transport. And we've uh, made this effort to consolidate 10 key cross-cutting messages. What um, you will find in the country chapters, no, the, the, the heart of, of this report, is really um, these perspectives on uh, changes that have taken place, for example, in domestic discourses, in governance, in the policy framework in general, and also examples of specific actions that have happened and others that have not happened. Um, Last, um, what we wanted to say is, is how we, 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 we hope that this is going to be used and what we think this is useful for. No? Um, the report aims at contributing to the process of collective learning, which we think no, it's also um, part of, of the Paris Agreement. 
and three, three dimensions of this learning. The first one, the mutual learning inside countries, because we, we, we believe and we, we hear from, from, from uh, all the country experts, there's no country that, that lacks more efforts into coordinating coherence of policies, uh, coherence within the policy framework to have, you know, integrate, to have a more integral climate policy or more mainstreamed in the real economy. So we hope that by exploring what is happening in countries that can also feed domestic debates on, on how to go further. Mutual learning among peers, because we know also that to reach the a scale of the transformation at the pace we need. We need to learn from each other a lot. And there are many best practices. Of course, the challenge is always that the context is very, very important and very specific. Um, but that's why if we speak as well as possible this context, then we are able to understand, okay, as my country, I see what is working in, in the other country and why, and be able to derive what can I you know, uh, learn from this and how can I use it in my own context. And third, learning to work together. Um, also, if I know what others are doing, I'll be um, better informed to define my position within those global movements. I will be able to understand how I can take advantage of the global trends and everything that is happening around me to jump you know, on the right boat. Um, and this, this, of course, all this learning um, is useless if it cannot be translated. And that's where it's feeding this into, um, we have to see it into higher ambition in the upcoming NDCs. And ultimately, no, um, action in the real economy. And this learning, we believe that contributes directly to that. But there is another leg with learning to work together. And is that we have this very important moment created in the Paris Agreement where the collective learning can germinate into some specific and very concrete agreements on how we can work better together, on how we can support each other better in support for these uh, national and sectoral um, transformations. And this is the global stock take. So, um, with this um, uh, approach and this effort that we we putting here on the table and we 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 providing for everyone to, to experiment this, um, we want to um, um, test the value of the approach to for for others to be able to build on this and to um, see whether using those principles that we were saying before we could organize an international discussion that is most useful no, to identify this international cooperation that should at the same time no, then fit into higher ambition and disease. So um, just to finish for us, very important to say, it is um, really a first step. Um, this report has a number of, of, of limitations in itself. It's not comprehensive. You will see specifically you know, in the country chapters, we are not having an assessment, a comprehensive assessment of progress. We've asked authors to highlight what is most striking, what is more relevant, B, for, for, the, um, for the importance in terms of um, increasing ambition, B, because are important messages that are not sufficiently known in the international community or are kind of hidden or that are very important because the international community could do something about them, no? about, for example, some of the obstacles that need to be overcome. So in a way, um, if we want to achieve this collective learning, much more efforts need to be put. And this is a call for others to build be within the academia or be um, uh, policy makers and other agents that have no? the, the, the power and the capacity to influence how we uh, structure all these global stock taking processes in the next two years. With that, I'm just left with thanking um, really everyone that supported the, the, um, this report at IDRI and beyond, and a warm thank you to the 70 authors who really are the ones that made this uh, uh, report possible. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Marta. Thank you for setting out the, the broad concept and the, the process that you went through. Um, so just a, a quick note that uh, the link to the report is available in the chat. So if you want to 
read it as, as you listen to the speakers, you can do that. Um, there's also a link to a uh, commentary in Climate Home News, um, which just uh, presents that theme as well. Um, we have a, a question, quick question from uh, Kofi Kumasi. Uh, will the slides be shared with the... Yes, I'm, I'm getting a nod and a thumbs up. So yes, they will. <laughs> um, and uh, so let's let's move on to the panel. So that's the broad concept. Um, and now we have some speakers talking about their examples in their, their country or their sector. Um, so first up, we have Chuck Okariki, uh, who is affiliated with a university with a, a, a very long name in Nigeria. Um, I'm going to use the acronym <laughs> IFUNAI. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, yep. will that do? <laughs> no, it's cold, yeah. um, but Chucks is a, is a great expert in, in sustainable development um, and will give us a bit of context from, from Nigeria, the Nigerian example. Take it away, Chucks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us uh, in this uh, uh, presentation. Um, I think perhaps my starting point is that Many of us in the developing country have often and consistently argued that although the uh, global climate change regime encapsulated by the UNFCCC is a great arena for mobilizing and inspiring action on climate change, when it comes to developing countries that this uh, regime does not provide a comprehensive picture in terms of capturing the activities of many developing countries. And one of the critical reasons why this is, is that for many developing countries, a lot of what passes as climate action continues not to be uh, labeled as climate action in these countries. Many of them are very highly focused on uh, growing their economies and achieving some kind of uh, sustainable development or development in broad terms. And the method of capturing carbon that is avoided, carbon that is sequestered, and uh, action that is leading to uh, less emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, have not been elaborate and sophisticated. For Nigeria, for example, you see that the uh, government has been pursuing aggressively uh, the establishment of railway lines in the country. A lot of the uh, transportation in Nigeria currently is by road transport, up to 80%. And a huge number of the, uh, the motor or the vehicles in these roads are very, very antiquated which mean that they generate a lot of pollution. So all those cars that you stop driving in France, in Germany, in US, if you uh, come with me in Nigeria, I can, I can show you where they are. Still uh, celebrated as new vehicles to be put to use for another 10 to 15 years. And so if you look at the NDC of Nigeria, for example, you see that the emission coming from transport is growing in leaps and bounds, and in some quarters have been projected as potentially going to outgrow emissions from, uh, from electricity generation. And so the government has put in a lot of effort to generate uh, new railway lines. But if you look at uh, the, the registry for Nigeria or all the accounts that the country and the international communities are providing about climate action in Nigeria, you will hardly see a mention of the railways that uh, the Nigerian government is building. This is one critical example of the sort of activities that Mata was referring to, where many governments in the developed world are pursuing the economic growth uh, that can enhance a low carbon future, but often do not get adequate recognition or credit for that. The second thing I want to highlight about what's going on in Nigeria that is, I think, uh, very uh, poorly understood by the global community is the way in which the Paria Agreement has catalyzed and mobilized a huge amount of um, knowledge and awareness of climate change among a cross-section of the community. 
I came back here from Oxford and Reading thinking that nobody or very limited people know about climate change in Nigeria. And was surprised to read report after report showing up to 80% of uh, 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 level of awareness among the population about climate catastrophe, but also uh, a huge number of about 75% saying that they would want government to take more action. I have gathered from my interaction with people that a great source of this socialization and awareness have been the, uh, the Paris uh, Agreement, both in terms of the way it was popularized by the French government, but also what the government did in trying to involve a wide section of people in uh, the drafting of their NDC, uh, where they had category, youth category, civil society category, labor, businesses, and they consulted widely among these various stakeholders in trying to write their NDC, and much more particularly in the process of revising their NDC. So Nigeria now have a, a, a revised NDC for 20% unconditional and 47% conditional. And actually, I think that many indices in Africa have been built to be some of the most uh, ambitious. The only challenge or the main challenge we have in the area of awareness is that this awareness does not often translate into a deep understanding of what needs to be done. So when you begin to talk about decarbonizations and pathways to decarbonization, people are struggling. So there is a superficial uh, but broad awareness among many people in the country. Another key revolution, if you like, that has happened in Nigeria, which in part has been instigated by the Paria Agreement and the process of its implementation has been the proliferation or growth in the number of CSOs that are working in this area. Many of them youth-based CSO, but also uh, women-based CSO and, and other types of CSOs. Unfortunately, from my interaction with them, since I've come back to Nigeria, I have also seen that they do not necessarily have the capacity and the wherewithal to influence policy. They are not well schooled in the art of persuasion, mobilization, and trying, uh, knowing what to do to, uh, to get uh, influence and impact. And this is where they will very much profit by networking and mentoring uh, from international CSO who have a huge amount of expertise and knowledge in this area. Nigeria, for example, continues to struggle in the area of establishment of a climate registry to be able to document what um, the white stakeholders are doing. And so, although there is a lot of action in multiple areas, uh, there is no comprehensive registry to be able to capture this. And lastly, in terms of governance and policy, what we see is Nigeria is characterized by a hodgepodge of sectoral policies that are driving decarbonization. But as Matt has said, they are, uh, we don't have enough framework to be able to recognize, to gather, to streamline, to mainstream many of these activities. We have very limited vertical integration and almost no horizontal integration. Um, a lot of the activities continue to be centered at the national level, but if you go down to the states, you have very limited on uh, action by the state government. And one last point, uh, Megan is looking at me, is the fact that I am still very uncomfortable that a lot of the green initiative, big projects in Nigeria are driven by donor money. And I would quite like to see a more deepening of climate uh, related budgeting in the country and the mobilization of uh, um, non-traditional non sources of finance to be able to implement climate action in the country. Thank you so very much. And uh, I think I'll hand over. Okay, thank you, Chucks. Um, I, I should have said um, we are running a little bit late already. So um, uh, if each speaker could uh, aim to keep their remarks for about five minutes, that would be great. And I'll nudge them as necessary. Um, but thank you, Chuck. So I think that, yeah, the main takeaways there are um, some of Nigeria's climate action is not actually being labelled as such. So the, the railway expansion um, is the government isn't really getting credit for that in the climate perspective. Um, there's a lot of 
appetite, uh, public desire for action, uh, but a, a fairly superficial understanding of what that means, um, and a sort of a hodgepodge of of, um, of, uh, of of initiatives, but but no overarching government governance framework. Um, so I think those are some really valuable um, valuable lessons from Nigeria, and I, I'm I'm kind of interested in this this um, this issue issue around uh, old cars from Europe being um, getting a, a prolonged life in in Nigeria as well. I think that's that's something that doesn't get a lot of attention and is is, is probably worth a bit of um, thinking about. Um, so anyway, let's move on to uh, Claire Healy, who is the director of the Washington DC office of E3G. So Claire, if you could keep it to five minutes, that would be thank wonderful. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, uh, Idri, for inviting me to this panel. You know, I'll try and keep the remarks short because the US, uh, what happens here in the US has splashed across, I think, uh, lots of... Um, and most of us have experienced and lived and worked hard to counteract the sort of stop-go nature of US climate diplomacy. Okay, the um Claire, I'm afraid your line is quite distorted. Um so I'm going to I'm going to suggest we we um jump to the next speaker and come back to you and see if your connection is improved. Um, I, I, in, the, in the report we sort of split our comments into two sections. I think I'll Okay, I, I think there's, there are some technical issues, some connection issues with Claire. So um, I'm just going to jump onto um, uh, the next a speaker. Bit about what's happening domestically? And and what, as we said, um, you know, in the US, it is very much uh, like a pendulum that shifts back and forth. We all think. Okay, it's a bit of a delay there. Um, so let's let's go to uh, Rodrigo and then, and then come back to, to Claire. So we have um, Rodrigo Palma, director at the Energy Centre at the University of Chile. Um, Rodrigo, take it away. Thank you very much, Megan. I want to test if you can hear me. That's great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so again, thank you for this opportunity. It's great to have the opportunity to talk to you about Chile. We organize the brief section with the authors that you can see, um, trying to look five years, five years after the Paris Agreement. That was so the mindset that we explain. And <clears throat> um, what it was um, clear for us is that it is more an expert judgment, as mentioned by Marta. We are not uh, in the line to, to talk about like a comprehensive discussion. We try to put all the references, of course, to support what we, we try to inform to you. So um, we organized the document in these four sections, um, climate policy and climate discourse in context, which is very important, and I will summarize key messages about this. Policies and actions, especially the update of our NDC, then institutional development, and finally action landscape, looking for the future with the challenges and some big opportunities. And I will concentrate uh, only in some of these messages in the brief presentation. <clears throat> First of all, one message is that uh, despite the uncertainties associated with the pandemic and social conflicts that we experience in Chile, I will explain, together with the usual resistance of the main emitting sectors, uh, mean the risk of not achieving these goals is very significant. This is our overall balance for Chile too. We have opportunities, but in, in real, we need to make a lot to, to overcome the risks that we, we are facing. And regarding institutional development, 
although there is still a long way to go for Chile to have a robust climate change institutional framework, uh, we believe really that significant progress has been made in the last 10 years. I will also talk a little bit about this. The main concern, although is not being able to advance at the sufficient pace demanded by climate RGT decision making. This is a second important message from our side. So uh, countries like Chile are looking and making uh, huge efforts, but we are far away to be uh, to have a robust institutional framework to deal with this. Um, a little explanation about, you can see here, social political crisis in Chile at the end of 2019, and right after that, COVID pandemic. So we, we are in a very special moment in Chile. We are now in the draft of a new constitution. We have presidential elections at the end of the year. So we are really, we summarize this as a transformational context, not only an energy transformation and overall transformation of the country. And in the transformational context describes um, environmental awareness, climate change, biodiversity, the use of natural resources and energy poverty have become particular and uh, relevant affairs in Chile. For example, the first framework law on climate change is currently being discussed. We hope to end this before the end of this year. Second, a plan for the retirement and, and or reconversion of coal-fired units was announced at the end of 2019 um, as a result of a voluntary jet binding agreement between the private sector and the government updated. So this is second issue. Uh, but despite of this progress, Chile continues to be highly dependent on fossil fuels, uh, adding up to 57% of their final energy consumption. So the challenge is very, very important. And in this context, of course, you can see on the right side, um, we have an energy renewal energy revolution. The, the line show here the development of solar energy only that you manage the numbers. We, the total installed capacity in electricity in Chile is 26, 27 gigawatts. And now we have four gigawatts from solar energy, zero seven years ago, and also a, a similar number in wind energy. So this is an important issue. And if we take into account that we have 1,800 gigawatts of potential, this is one big opportunity for our country. Let me go fast to, close the message. The updated NDC, as you can see, is also a second important aspect. You can see that we try to move far away from this red line to the green line with the mitigation actions, but we will not arrive to zero emissions. We will arrive to zero net emissions or carbon neutrality in 2050 with LULUCF. Forestry sector is quite important because it is a net sink sector for us, but we rely on the risk on fires and rely on the risk of this uh, critical aspect and the impact on biodiversity, et cetera. And of course, we have some important sectors that are not in line with this. The last two messages are uh, transport, as mentioned by, by Chuck, is, is an important issue. Here is the trend for transportation. We are not able to go really down. We are able to stabilize this to, uh, in 2050. So this is one challenge. And finally, our the opportunity for Chile to export a renewable energy or to attract uh, the uh, international industry to Chile is is the big challenge today. We have a new hydrogen, green hydrogen uh, strategy. And today the discussion is if we can configure, and this is, is regarding the international cooperation, Latin America as an exportation area of renewables to the rest of the world. And this is an important issue that I believe is must be part of COP26 in at least at regional level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo, and you kept beautifully to time there, so I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, so in Chile, you're you have you're at a transformational moment politically um, with the, the 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 new constitution under development, presidential election, um, and and a lot's going on with solar development and retiring coal um, work to do on on the forestry sector and, uh, and so on. But we can come back to those things. So thank you for that. Um, I think uh, Claire. 
Claire apparently had some issues with building work in her neighbourhood, um, but we'll, we'll come back to Claire and see if the, the connection is better now. Um, Claire, let's try again. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Megan. And it, I think it says a lot about US infrastructure and the need for investment, given that I just, uh, the internet didn't last. Um, to try and make up time, I'm just going to summarise what, what I think is going on in the US in terms of governance and delivery mechanisms. Because as, as I was saying, you all know, because you read it across the front pages, the stop-go nature of the US climate diplomacy. And I'm not going to waste any time talking about the previous administration. I'm, I think we've all seen and I think breathed a sigh of relief when the new administration started. And I think we can summarise the first few months, say the last 10 months, I think with the Biden administration, they have made climate uh, action, climate diplomacy, a top tier foreign policy issue and a central and core pillar of the administration. They've appointed, I think, quite impress an impressive array of passionately devoted uh, individuals, uh, many of whom we've worked with in the last four years, into key positions across government. Um, and a sort of a central organizing principle of the administration. The issue is, I think there are many competing top political priorities, including the pandemic, the economic recovery, and also other foreign policy issues like we've seen in Afghanistan. So it's still competing for political energy and oxygen. But um, we have seen the US step up at, uh, and, and sort of try and um, mobilize the full machinery of the US federal government and really trying to deploy this whole of economy approach to uh, driving down emissions in the US economy, and then also uh, trying to galvanize more ambition from other economies around the world. Um, the main, so we saw the Biden Climate Summit uh, where the US stepped up with their NDC of 50 to 52% by 2030 with a 2005 baseline. And I think the work of civil society really pushing them to maximize that was a, a, a key to getting that, that sort of NDC. Um, the issue is though, what is the delivery mechanism, right? To, to sort of credibly uh, ask other countries to step up, we need to see sort of the framework domestically, how they're gonna do that. Um, and they have in, uh, instituted a interagency process. So um, to deploy, as I said, all, all instruments, every tool across the federal government. So we've seen, uh, climate uh, plans and key climate personnel in all departments, not just state, energy and treasury, but also the likes of transportation, commerce and trade, right? So there's this strong interagency process. They're looking to hardwire, I think, this driving down emissions into all government departments. Even if it doesn't say climate on the tin, I think they are looking everywhere to how they can, and use every tool to drive down emissions to deliver that 50 to 52%. The key delivery vehicle though is um, for Congress. I won't take time trying to explain this very complicated dual prong strategy, which boggles the mind. Uh, suffice it to say, you know, they did get a bipartisan infrastructure plan through Congress, um, which had new money in, I think $550 billion of new money, part of which is to try and build out some clean energy infrastructure, e for example, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, but the bigger package is still being negotiated in Congress. Every day we wake up to new news. And it, this is the, um, uh, again, an arcane process, which I won't uh, elaborate on, but a budget rec reconciliation bill at the moment is a huge package of $3.5 trillion, uh, a big part of which is uh, set aside for uh, new infrastructure and to deal with climate impacts and build a re resilient, more resilient infrastructure. That is currently being negotiated. And who knows when and how, like September was a deadline. We're hoping in October we get the package so that the US can show up to the COP with more credibility that they have this main vehicle in place to deliver what they've said they're going to deliver. Um, other, other tools have used Domestically, there are a lot of executive orders from the uh, from the president, including on financial regulation, phasing out fossil fuel financing, uh, and stopping pipelines, etc. So they are some of the tools. So suffice it to say, domestically, um, uh, they're trying. I think in the you know, the midterm elections are just around the corner, so it's unclear um, how much runway the Biden administration will have. So I think they're right to focus to get what they can through Congress 
using executive orders, you know, while they have a majority, a simple majority in the house, but it is on a nice edge. So we'll see, we'll see how that transpires. Just a word on what they're doing di diplomatically. So uh, obviously we had the Biden climate summit as soon as they came in in 100 days, which was, I think, no mean feat. Um, John Kerry's sort of tireless shuttle diplomacy around the world, trying to mobilize more ambition from other major economies. Um, and uh, using, I think, sort of other international organizations and processes such as the G7, we'll see what comes out of the G20, and also these international institutions such as the IMF, the World Bank and others. So I think we're just beginning to see that, but um, I think we're all disappointed on the finance offer that the US uh, sort of, the, the budget request that the US has made, the Biden administration asked Congress for, that's an area we're pushing, I think, a lot further. So we should solidarity and work towards more international equity. Um, so I think, I think it's a good start, the first 10 months, but really we want to look at what gets done now over the next, you know, the full four years of the Biden administration. And a key point is we've got to hardwire this in, not just to the US domestic um, apparatus, but also trying to hardwire the maximum amount of ambition and restructuring of the institutions and the processes we have internationally. Because if you know the eye on the prize is reducing emissions, not just in the US economy, but around the world, and we've got to maximize what we can get done while we have uh, the Biden administration and to minimize the risk that we slide backwards in the future. I'll stop there, Megan. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Yes, um, as always, the issue with the US. So, so the Biden administration are doing more than any previous administration to try and institutionalize climate action across agencies. Um, but uh, is it resilient against a, a return to Republican um, government? Uh, that is the big, big challenge. Um, and uh, big question marks about climate finance as well. The U US is way behind other developed uh, economies in terms of donations or contrib contributions. Um, so I will now, next I'll hand over to Emily Hosek, uh, who is with Slowcat, and does knowledge analysis and policy advocacy, it says here. Yes. <laughs> What's your Thank analysis you. of the knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try, to, <laughs> Go I'll try to summarize it for the for the sector here. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so I just want to be by really underlining the urgency of the situation we're fa facing in the transport sector, whereas we're seeing a lot of progress in other major sectors, emissions and transport are really going in the wrong direction, as as highlighted in a few of the country interventions we've just heard. Um, in 2019, transport was the second largest source of global CO2 emissions after the power sector, and it's currently the fastest growing source of emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the world. This is mainly due to an increase in road transport for both passengers and freight, a surge in aviation and shipping, and rising preferences for larger vehicles such as SUVs. Um, at the same time, global ambition to reduce emissions from transport is low and insufficient, only about 15% of the updated nationally determined contributions have set specific transport mitigation targets. So to reach the objectives of the Paris Agreement, the transport sector will need to approach absolute zero emissions by 2050. And I think the takeaway here is that simply cannot be achieved without structural transformations, which go beyond simply relying on carbon offsets, for example, to compensate for emissions. Um, it also won't be achieved by replacing conventional internal combustion engine vehicles with electric vehicles, which is really dominating the global discourse on transport decarbonization right now. Um, we're still seeing that 97% of energy used to power transport still comes from fossil fuels, and transport is the energy use sector with the lowest share of renewable energy use. So even when we're switching to electric vehicles, we're, we're still relying on fossil fuels to power them, at least in the short to medium term. So what is it going to take to reverse these trends in rising transport emissions? I want to highlight just three major takeaways from the chapter. Um, first is we really need to change our approach to transport decarboniz decarbonization. Um, there's been too much focus on working to increase this endless um, supply of transport without really looking at what's causing the demand. And we're not going to get to where we need to be without working to reduce unnecessary travel for both passengers and freight. Um, people and businesses use transport to access other goods, services, and markets, and not for the sake of transport itself. 
So we really need to look at the decisions and underlying determinants that influence transport demand, but which are currently not considered within the scope of transport planning. For example, the production and consumption of goods and services, urban and rural land use and development pa patterns, ensuring internet access for all, pricing and other fiscal decisions, just to name a few, all have a substantial impact on transport demand and behavior. So working to reduce this demand will require us to rethink both the design of our cities and metropolitan areas, as well as our global supply chains. Um, on the city side, we're really seeing some cities begin to curb unnecessary travel by redesigning and ad adapting their built environment so that residents are able to access most of their daily needs, housing, employment, shopping, healthcare, et cetera, within a limited radius where walking, biking, or public transport are the most efficient modes of transport in, times, in terms of time and cost. Um, while this idea has been greatly popularized in Europe, we're actually seeing some examples of cities such as Houston, Texas, and Chengdu, China, taking on variations of this concept tailored to their specific development patterns. This type of planning also requires a lot more coordination than we're seeing, um, coordination across different city agencies, including transport, urban and land use, uh, planning, housing, social services, economic development, etc. cetera. Um, turning to supply chains, Freight accounts for an estimated 40% of transport emissions. We, we focus a lot on passenger transport, but freight is a really big, big part of the emissions. Um, and projections show that global demand um, could triple by 2050. So with technological solutions such as zero emission vehicles, aircraft and long distance trucks still quite far from maturity, it's going to be really critical to find ways to rework global supply chains to reduce the unnecessary travel of goods. So this will mean moving towards more local and circular production and consumption systems to shorten supply chains, promoting a less resource intensive sharing economy and focusing shipment and stock management strategies on ensuring efficiency by aggregating deliveries, for example. These changes could um, reduce unnecessary transport distances and also facilitate the use of lower carbon modes of transport, such as short haul electric trucks and cargo bikes in cities. The second takeaway I want to highlight is that, as we can see from both of these examples, a wide range of stakeholders impact travel demand and behavior far beyond the governments, planners, and engineers who are traditionally seen as having the largest impact on, on our transport systems. For example, decisions from employers, schools, retailers, medical facilities, among many others, all impact transport demand and are therefore critical factors in its transformation. Policymakers and those leading transport decarbonization efforts will therefore need to find ways to engage this diverse and larger set of stakeholders in their planning and decision making processes. Um, for this, we will need much more robust and comprehensive coordination mechanisms at the local, regional, local and regional levels, but also at the national and international levels. Um, the third and final takeaway is that we need to redirect financing to support the transition to zero emission transport. Two major points here, the first being the urgent need to end fossil fuel subsidies and use that money to support public transport and other low carbon transport modes. Since the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015, G20 member countries have spent more than $3 trillion on fossil fuel subsidies. Um, there are obviously a lot of political and social challenges associated with ending these subsidies as we've seen in a few countries. So the key here is really to have viable and affordable transport alternatives in place before working to end those subsidies. Um, and the second point is that we need to better incorporate the social and environmental costs of transport into the actual price of transport. Uh, right now, taxpayers are subsidizing many of the negative impacts of transport, such as road crashes, air pollution, congestion, which costs society billions of dollars every year. Um, and users are only really paying a fraction of this full societal cost. So we need to make more efforts to really fully align user fees and costs. Um, this can be done using measures such as road tolls, parking fees, and congestion pricing, which we're seeing you know, infamously in London and starting to see in other cities around the world. So just to end in summary, we really, we're not gonna be able to rely on carbon offsets in transport and technology solutions only to reach zero emissions by 2050. We need to alter our approach, focus on demand, redesign our cities and supply chains, engage a much broader group of stakeholders in the transition and re really redirect our financing away from fossil fuels and towards more low carbon modes. 
Great, thank you, Emily. Some good um, big picture international conclusions there on transport, um, how we need to address the demand side and planning as well as supply. It's more than just electric cars um, and offsets. So thank you for that. Um, so we uh, will have a little change to the order now. Um, so we have Amit Garg is going to give an Indian perspective, but I'm just going to ask you to hold off for a, uh, a few minutes, Amit, because Mikol Salmeri from the 2050 Pathways platform uh, has to leave promptly at three. So I'm um, just going to fit Mikol in uh, first. Um, so Mikol, uh, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Megan. And uh, sorry, Amit, for <laughs> hijacking your speaking slot. Um, so thank you very much to um, to Idri for inviting me to take part in this event and thank you to all the other panelists for the great insights so far. I'll, I'll try to, to be brief um, and again apologies in advance for having to leave afterwards. I would have loved to stay um, on the panel and discuss these issues further. But um, just to give uh, again a little bit of more into sort of the, the general um, the general background and how it relates to, to long-term strategy. So we all know that it's really not an easy task to illustrate how countries can pursue their national development priorities while achieving deep decarbonization by mid-century, so consistent with the Paris Agreement temperature goals. And uh, really, to a large extent, DDP has really created a snowball effect in, in getting this community of practice around modeling and has really helped countries in building serious um, long-term strategies. So when we look at the Paris Agreement, um, in the Paris Agreement, the spirit of long-term low emission development strategies is really for countries to explore their ability to fully decarbonize and then hopefully to work back um, to today and really identify those immediate policy changes that can help them put the countries on track. So the long-term strategies and the emission pathways will really tell us a lot about how far or how close we are to the global goal um, to reach net zero around 2050. But whilst um, the long-term strategies and the NDCs are really essential um, policy instruments, there's also these deeper drivers that we need to understand, which are not always systematically captured in, in the strategies. And so... And it's extremely important to have the NECs and long-term strategies and other national development policies to trigger the conversation and ultimately action as well. Um, but um, and, and they're, of course, also critical to evaluate our collective ambition as um, official submissions by, by parties. But in order to depict um, the fuller range of changes and, and, and transformation necessarily, um, the assessment of progress enabled by the Paris Agreement can also be um, broader um, than the quantitative um, metrics and, um, you know, focus on whether it's about um, the governance structures, institutions, in-country climate change discourse. Um, and so all these aspects that we've already heard now from panelists about, or even more critical sort of concrete short-term actions that are really transforming our um, addiction to, to fossil fuels, if we can call it this way. And we know that there's still a gap between the net zero intentions and countries' near term decisions. And um, there's this need to align the broader um, policy frameworks, whether it's um, fiscal, financial, budgetary, regulatory, with the climate um, imperative. And you know, a lot um, needs to be done to facilitate the transition and um, many policy roadblocks uh, still to be removed. And the alignment agenda is a long-term agenda, but we're really increasingly seeing um, an increased awareness around the issue of climate change um, among decision makers. And we've had already heard about great examples of sectoral transformations. Um, and those original labeled as hard to abate sectors are occurring. So for instance, you know, in, in industry, to take an example, we're really seeing a surge of um, activities on product requirements, production standards, Countries start collaborating on public procurement for low carbon steel and, and, and cement. And um, the, the change is not only happening from you know, within the sectors themselves, looking at new technological solutions, but governments are increasingly trying to, to prompt change. And, and sometimes it's also nudged by those policy developments in other economies, such as the Green Deal and, and the carbon border adjustment mechanism discussions. And um, 
not to, to repeat myself, but really in our view of the platform, the DDP initiative um, and its broad community really played a key role in, in getting these dynamics going and ensuring the reality of, of the transition. So to conclude, as we look at, at COP, um, we, we need to collectively create a stronger understanding and acceptance amongst countries of um, what the Paris Agreement meant exactly in relation to um, net zero. And that is also a better collective understanding of what it takes to decarbonize an economy in the three decades to come. And so what is the, the benchmark set of actions required in policy, regulations, infrastructure? So um, the DDP approach is useful. It really tries to, to illustrate this critical part of what achieving it really means physically at country level, not just in 2050, but today and the different paths that countries can be on. And lastly, when it comes to the global stock take, um, and, and what we've heard today already is that, you know, looking beyond numbers, um, look, having this um, bottom-up approach, and it will be really interesting to, to assess all those qualitative indicators that could really reflect on um, real life changes that have happened on, on the ground. So um, thank you very much again. And we're at the 2050 Pathways platform. Look forward to continuing this conversation and working with you all on this. Um, so thank you. And um, yeah, I wish you a good rest of, of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mikol. I think you've finished there just in time to get to your next engagement. So um, thank you for your input. Um, and uh, so we will just go back now to Amit, who's from the first panel, uh, professor at Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. Um, please, Amit, uh, tell us about your perspective. Yeah. Thank you very much. First, first of all, let me thank Idri and uh, IKI and BMU, I think this is one of the very good work which the flexibility has been given by ITRI to all the country teams to explore their own bottom-up uh, modeling and bottom-up policies, what is happening. So this is exceptional, I would say. Normally, it's top-down, but this was bottom-up. So this is very good. India is a large country, so we have large canvas. So first thing, let me, let me tell you the greenhouse gas emissions in 2006 or latest 2019 were about 3.3 billion ton of CO2 equivalent, 3.3 billion ton. And under DDP scenarios, we created two scenarios. Under them, we do not go below 2.5 billion ton scenario. Not, in 2050. So that is with all the efforts possible. So that is one thing to be noted. 14% in 2019, 3.3 billion ton, 14% is contributed by Lulu CF. Agri uh, Lulu CF. And another 14%, 15% is from non CO2 gases from agriculture sector. So the second one is very difficult to abate in our opinion because this is small dispersed farmers. So this is, uh, and livestock, this is very difficult to, to do that. Coal contribute 50% of Indian emissions, coal. It, is, it provides energy security. So if somebody says that India, when are you coming out of coal? I would say until we have alternate fuels, we will not be able to come out. So that is, that is the story. And the other thing is, we have mapped about 150 plus direct policies of government of India and 60% of them are after Paris. So this is to be noted. These are climate greenhouse gas mitigation policies about 85, 90 policies have come after 2015, which is remarkable now. And then there are contributions, NDC contributions. We have three main contributions. We are meeting two of them already. Uh, uh, and the third one, forestry, is a little tricky, but we will also meet that. The another point is, Transitions. India is seeing many, many transitions. We are going for huge solar and renewable energy capacity, which was 20 gigawatt by 2030. 
enhanced to 175, now enhanced to 450 gigawatt. Please understand that our total per day maximum load is about 200 gigawatt. So we are planning huge capacity to, of renewables in, in this country. We are also pushing energy efficiency across sectors. We are also pushing electric vehicles. By 2030, 30% of new vehicles have to be electric vehicles in India. It is a, it's a big, big number. And all these policies, what I've told, they have a business angle behind them. There are businesses who are putting, there are businesses who have, who are contributing about 10% of Indian greenhouse gas emissions, and they have contributed for becoming net zero by 2030 or before 2040. Businesses. And out of this 450 gigawatt, the richest man in Asia who holds big business in India, who's an Indian, he has promised to put 100 gigawatt by 2030, renewable power and green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, the price of which should go down from present $5 to $1 per kg in next one decade. This is a huge, huge commitment. And there are, of course, socio-economic political compulsions for various dimensions, which cannot be ruled out, which cannot be swept behind under the carpet, but we are handling them. For example, coal mine e-auction. In the last auction, 16 mines did not find any buyer. So, and solar, we are growing at a very, very high pace, very, very fast pace. So these things are very positive. Of course, if we want to say what we need from international community, we need acknowledgement, two or three things, acknowledgement that climate action would require financing. That is the first thing we have to acknowledge. It will not happen in just out of blue. No, it needs to be built up in the financial systems globally. Green finance, climate change finance, including mitigation adaptation, has to be provided some support by international funding agencies, by bilateral, the first thing. The second thing is technologies. All the many technologies are available, but let us say battery technologies. Let us say integrating renewables into grid. So all these things have to be brought on uh, very strongly. Business, as I said, already a lot of businesses have already committed, which whose total net worth may be about 600, 700 billion dollars. They have already committed to become net zero by 2030, 2040. And also net zero is not only talking about CO2, it is about methane, N2O, which are coming from agriculture sector mainly. So we have to have a holistic perspective of all these things. And of course, India is worried about climate change, not because uh, we are growing, because we have a lot of impacts on our population. I stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, I Amit, mean, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure we could uh, listen to uh, you talk about India's climate policy all day, but um, we have um, a packed schedule and we are running a little over time. Um, so thank you so much. There's some really positive trends in India in terms of the, the, the ambition for solar power. Uh, there are some big, uh, big companies that have set net zero targets. Um, there are some really tricky areas around forestry and, and, and uh, agriculture. Um, and, you know, coal is still pretty huge uh, as an energy source um, so there needs to be some kind of transition plan for that um, so uh, we've heard there let's just take a little breather so this is where we were meant to um, uh, have a break between the panels and we just we just uh, mixed up the order a little bit there to fit me call in um, so we've heard from Nigeria we've heard from Chile we've heard from the US we've heard from India four countries with very different development contexts very different stages of embedding climate climate um, into sort of institutional capacity um, uh, and very different political contexts as well. 
Um, and then we've also heard about uh, transport as a sector internationally and some of the, the cross-cutting themes. Um, so there's a lot to chew over from those panellists. Um, I once again encourage you to ask your questions. I think we've actually had um, one question that's just been answered privately by, by a panellist, so that's also an option. Uh, so if you have any questions for the panellists, they might be able to answer you directly, um, and, and then we'll come back um, after the next panel um, and pick up as many of those questions as we can and, and generate a bit of discussion and debate around that. Um, so I do encourage you to, to make use of the question and answer um, function. Um, great. So coming up next, we have uh, we have four more experts uh, who are lined up to talk, to respond to the themes raised by this report and give their own perspective. Um, so first up, we have Tasneem Esup, who is the Executive Director of Climate Action Network International, uh, which is the a huge network of uh, environmental civil society organizations around the world. I think it's more than 1,500 now, Tasneem. She's not um, uh, and so they're hugely influential and important um, and uh, sort of um, I, I know that Tasneem before the, this this event asked if she could be a bit provocative so I'm sure she'll have some interesting things to say um, I know she's particularly concerned about uh, access to the COP for, for civil society representatives uh, who are not able to access COVID vaccines um, and, and the, the inequities around that so um, Tasneem I'll, I'll give you the floor um, please Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Megan, and uh, greetings to everybody. Um, first, a big thank you and congratulations to IDRI and the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Initiative for this really important report. And like Amit said before, the bottom-up nature of the report is extremely important. Uh, we are living in a a Paris Agreement architecture that is, in fact, a very bottom up by nature. So this report, I believe, will contribute to the overall efforts that we all need to take to address the climate crisis. So I recognize that we have limited time. So I want to make a few observations um, that I hope would contribute to the overall debate and discussion and how this report can um, contribute to our work. The first is, you know, the issues related to deep decarbonization, and I love the report's title of, you know, beyond the numbers. And a number of speakers already alluded to these other non-quantifiable elements of transformation that we need to also factor in. So I want to dig a little bit into that. The one issue, of course, is you know, looking at this um, kind of long-term strategies within the overall transformational uh, initiatives, the kind of what has been called elsewhere as the just transition, what the IPCC calls on us to do in terms of radical transformation of our systems, economic, social, etc. So in that context, it is important to factor in the issue of what is uh, maybe to an extent non-quantifiable but critical, and that is the issue of ensuring justice in these extremely difficult and challenging and complex transformations which emission reductions is just one part of. So that's the first issue I'd like to raise. And so linked to this concept of ensuring justice in these long-term strategies, it's important to look at it through, uh, well, the more than three, but I'd like to highlight the issue of procedural justice, for example. So fundamentally ensuring the inclusion of all voices in the process and in decision-making. Procedural justice is going to be really critical for the success of these massive transformational processes. The second one I would say is of course the kind of redistributive or distributive justice um, that we would have to look at and where these trade-offs happen. And again, especially for developing countries, but I think this is no longer just along the fault lines where poverty and inequality, I've just read 
you know, the kind of situation in the UK, for example, we know what's going on in the US, where poorer communities, communities of color, in fact, are bearing impacts and burdens far more than others. In contexts like that, justice and redistribution would have to have all those voices um, contributing to these pathways. These are decisions. These are not, as Marta says, uh, techno-economic things. These are plans that we are making that will affect the lives of all of our people. And the final one, of course, transformative justice. So if we look at uh, you know, this, uh, long these long-term strategies, the transformations that are needed and would happen would have to also ensure justice as an outcome of the process. So first set of issues I want to raise, Megan, is to ensure that justice is also located within these long-term uh, strategies and plans uh, for deep decarbonization. The second thing that I want to forefront, and I think it's often overlooked in our discourse and our technical work, um, you know, and if we are extremely honest, but when we ask the question, but why are we not getting the levels of action we require? Let's not forget that power and politics play a really important role in that. And when I talk about power and politics, I include vested interests. And so we are all familiar, for example, about how the fossil fuel industry has been absolutely successful in disrupting attempts to be much more ambitious than what we can do and the influence that they have in turn on the politics of our society. So I think, you know, these, what I'm trying to identify are those elements that we need to be a bit more upfront about and clear about so that we don't assume, you know, that you, you've developed this pathway, it's going to be a neat way of achieving the outcome and all of this messy stuff about, you know, dynamics of politics and power is not a real influence. We have to be honest about that. And then we have to be clear that these, the politics and power plays out in different um, dimensions. We have, of course, within countries, the kind of power and politics dynamic, but we also have that very clearly between countries. And yet again, we should not ignore the fact with the history of our, um, let me just make it simple, the history of our world, you know, the politics between those who are most powerful in the world and those who are not. And those dynamics play out in everything we are doing on climate change. Um, it affects trade relations, it affects the way money is flowing, et cetera, et cetera. So let's not forget that dimension. Then thirdly, the issue that I really think in terms of our governance conversation and the institutional arrangements we set up is the big piece on accountability. And linked to that, consequences you know we we can hold we can have um, uh, you know all these sessions where we all hold each other to account and the global stock take will be a good opportunity to do that but where are the consequences and that's not uh, something that we are addressing sharply enough of course you know the role civil society plays in this is important but certainly we have to look at a, a stronger institutional mechanisms for that and then lastly, um, you know, I, I do think that um, we are talking about beyond numbers in terms of emission reduction, but I, I also think we have to have this conversation in the very real immediate context where alarm bells have been signaled around, you know, the IPCC's recent report, the release of that report, the issue that we are running out of time, um, I think the UNSG said it was a code red for humanity. So while we're looking at the long term, we absolutely have to be clear that we have to address the short term and what that would need. And so linked to this, we would have to also, as we're trying to get deep decarbonization, and as we recognize that, in fact, we're not achieving the levels that we should, what we need to understand is the consequence of that. 
And we're experiencing the consequence of that very, very drastically. So the impacts of climate change is coming fast and furious and devastating. And so part of these massive transformations would have to include how we protect people, how we build resilience, and especially resilience to multiple crises. And I'm going to leave it there, Megan, because I see that you're going to tell <laughs> Thank me. Thank you, Tasneem. So a very strong theme of, of justice in there. And I think quite a lot of things that perhaps some of the, the panelists from the, the first session could pick up on. I'm sure Chucks will be interested to explore a bit more about the, the consultation process in Nigeria, for example. Um, there's definitely Definitely some justice issues in, in terms of who's driving the agenda, donors or, or the Nigerian people. Um, uh, I think um, there's some questions around yeah, the, the influence of the fossil fuel industry. I'd be interested to see, for example, uh, in the, the transport sector, um, there was mention of you know, fossil fuel subsidies. So perhaps you know, the influence of the fossil fuel industry in there would be quite a, something interesting to come back to. Um, and yeah, what are the, we have a, an accountability process in terms of the global stock take, but um, there is no enforcement mechanism mechanism in the Paris Agreement. So what like how do you how do you sort of apply some consequences for um for 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 not doing your bit or for for, for obstructing action. So uh, lots lots to chew over there. Um, so next up we have David Wasco, um, the director of WRI's International Climate Initiative, a uh, great veteran of climate talks um, and uh, a, a, a really um, smart guy. David. Thanks, Megan. Um, and um, it's great to be part of this event and um, be able to um, highlight this terrific report, which I think, as many people have said, really does focus on some key issues. Um, much of our work at WRI, um, I think, is, as many of you know, focuses on how it all adds up. So we do do that top down thing. We, we look at uh, where we're headed when you look at the um, policies in place, the commitments that have been made in NBCs, net zero, et cetera, um, and then assess how far along um, we've gotten, where the gaps are, and how far we need to go. Um, and all that remains absolutely critical. Uh, one of the things that um, we like to um, reinforce is that this needs to be a bifocals approach. We can't um, simply look at um, the long term or the near term, we have to do both. We have to keep in mind where we need to head by mid-century, um, but also what needs to happen in the very near term in order to get us there. And you can't get to 2050 without going through 2030, and you can't get to 2030 even without going through the next several years. So we, we need to have that kind of combined vision. And um, I think this report, um, although it's not its emphasis, does help us in in keeping in mind both of those dimensions, that long-term vision that the opposite side of the river we're trying to get to, and then what we need to do, what, how we get the oars in the water right now to be able to get us there. Um, in doing that, it, it is critical to look at this often from a country perspective, and even, uh, and often especially from a local perspective. Um, we've done work showing how strong action, how climate ambition can really play out in countries in important ways. Um, for example, working with the Indonesian Ministry of Planning, BAPANAS, um, modeling work that shows that strong climate action across land use, energy, et cetera, uh, can really put them on a strong path for economic growth. These things are not intention. And in fact, taking that strong climate action over the next couple of decades is essential to be able um, to have that, that economic growth. Um, so that's, I, I think, emphasizing that as well as part of um, uh, the dynamic and, and how we see the process of ambition is quite critical. Uh, that said, I do wanna turn now to what I think is one of the strengths of this report, which is really this emphasis on transformation at the sectoral level, um, that global targets, even national economic and uh, planning and emissions targets, all of that is critically important. But we also need to think about this in terms of how we really do transform the various sectors and aspects of our society. And so that, that, that is absolutely critical. And what I wanna um, really sort of emphasize and underscore in saying this, and I think this echoes a lot of what Tasneem just said, is that in thinking about that kind of deep transformation at the sectoral level, 
um, and across our society, we really do need to bring that social dimension, those questions of justice and just transition into the mix. And without that, we're not going to have the kind of level of ambition. We're not going to have a sustainable approach to this task um, in a way that's really going to deeply transform um, the society and economy to the degree that we need. Um, so it has to be integral to ambition. I think it's important to remember that um, in doing its work, the IPCC um, has pointed to uh, one of the shared socioeconomic pathways, SSP1, um, as the one that really would allow us to get on a 1.5 degree trajectory if we pushed it to the max. And that SSP is the most equitable of all of the SSPs and includes things like broad access to energy, um, broad access to education. And so I think we see there with that without that approach that really looks at the social context and equity, um, we're not gonna be able to get where we need to go. Um, we've seen a lot of this also played out in the sort of classical sense of just transition. How do we transition in uh, coal, for example, with workers and communities? Um, we are now looking and working with folks like Chuck's on the oil and gas sector. And um, what does a just transition look like there? And I, I think that actually brings to the fore some um, broader questions that we need to tackle um, in thinking about some of this transition. For example, what is revenue? Uh, what, what do revenues look like? How do we deal with budgets? Um, how do we deal with economic diversification in countries? Um, these questions come to the fore when you're thinking about that. I think there's similar issues across a number of areas. Um, energy, of course, in terms of energy access and approaches there, um, transport uh, and urban systems. And I would just point, by the way, to what Chuck's noted in terms of where the old cars go, where the combustion engines are gonna land, and with transport, we need to think from that end of the value chain all the way back to the question of critical minerals and how do we um, deal with those in ways that protect labor rights, protect communities, and are done uh, in a socially equitable way. Um, rural areas, how do we deal with agriculture and forests? Um, one, one can go on, uh, of course. I think one of the areas that's an interesting new piece of the puzzle is industry, heavy industry, cement, steel. How do we transform those in ways that are socially equitable. Um, we're starting to see movement there. So how, how do we play that out? Um, and then I'd like to conclude with finance in particular. Without finance, without the kind of resources that we need, without investment, we're not gonna be able to get where we need to go across all of these sectors. Um, and it, there is an important social and equity dimension to that as well. Um, I think some of that's been coming to the fore. We've seen greater discussion of that with uh, talk about debt relief and, and how critical debt relief is to countries so that they can um, both continue to pursue uh, emissions reduction strategies, but also really address their adaptation and resilience needs. And, and, and as Tasneem said, um, we need to think about adaptation and resilience and how we deal with impacts in a very integrated way with how we're thinking about this broader question of ambition. Those are those are questions that can't be completely um, siloed off from how, how we pursue this sectoral transformation. Um, important discussion there, I think, happening around um, debt relief. There are discussions happening around private finance access. I think those need to grow. Um, who has access to that finance? How do we make that more equitable? And then the last thing I would, I would note is that I think we need to pay greater attention um, from a climate perspective to debates like global minimum taxes. Um, how do we create an equitable tax system internationally, one that taxes corporations fairly so that we do have the resources we need, the investment um, potential we need in order to drive climate action? That we shouldn't see that tax question off on one side separate from climate. We really have to think about that social and equity question around taxes in a very closely linked way to the action we're going to take on climate. Um, so as, as I've sort of underscored, I think bringing to the table these social and equity questions is essential in order to have the truly deep transformation that we need over the coming decades. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of things thrown into the mix there, but um, again, sort of focus on the 
equity and, and uh, transition, um, debt relief being a really important one with the, the pandemic that a lot of countries have gone deeper into debt um, and uh, don't really have the, the sort of um, fiscal space to, to invest in climate as, as well as um, pandemic relief. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of good stuff in there. We've had a, a question, and I might just throw it into the mix now because I, I realise we are um, overrunning a little bit in terms of um, the the speakers. So I, I'm, I'm just going to put this question out there, and Monica um, can perhaps answer it, 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 include it in her remarks. She's up next. Um, so the question is, in fact, uh, what happens if I do answer live? Yeah. Okay. Um, Grisel menaces. Um, a question for all panelists. Can you mention country initiatives or policies aiming at addressing extreme carbon inequalities? Um, so, uh, and the referencing um, the uh, Oxfam research that showed that the 10% of wealthiest people account for over half of emissions. Um, so that's that's a bit of a question that any of the panelists feel free to pick up um, and, uh, and we might come back to it um, later as well. So please, if you have any questions, do, um, do uh, put them in the box and we'll, we'll try and address them either, well, yeah, over the next half hour, we have two more speakers lined up and then we'll, um, we'll get through as many questions as we can. So please do ask your questions. Um, so next we have Monica Araya, um, who is a uh, special advisor to the high level climate action champion for COP26. So Monica, I'm sure you can speak to um, how these themes are going to be picked up uh, at the COP, uh, which we believe is going ahead despite some calls to postpone it. Well, I, I will give you my very personal views um, because I'm, I work for several initiatives. One is obviously related to the climate champions, but I also work with, um, for example, the global campaign to end the internal combustion engine. So I, I will combine elements of, of, of the climate work and the climate agenda that, we're, that we have talked about. And I will bring other elements based on my experience as an activist and because of the question you just made, I will start with the very first point that I, I was going to make anyway, and it connects to points that others have made, especially David and Tasnim. So one observation that I have from looking at Latin America and Costa Rica in particular, I am from Costa Rica and I, I live there and I also live in Amsterdam. One observation I have is that post-COVID, if we want to really look at how serious a government is thinking about the climate crisis, we will have to look at their fiscal model. Because right now, that is where you have the political energy. You have the political energy of the government, you have the political energy of the Congress, you have the political energy of the opposition. And one observation I have is that we are nowhere near with political parties and, and, and their understanding that if we do not create fiscal space for decarbonization and especially resilience, we're just not going to make it. People will die and our countries will get in deep trouble. So one of the most difficult things that we have ahead of us in the next five years I am more familiar with Latin America, but I'm pretty sure it's the same in other, in other countries, especially in the South, in the global South, is that people lose elections when you say you're going to tax the wealthy or the, the companies. And, and that is where I think middle-income economies, for example, I'm talking about Chile, Costa Rica, Colombia, countries that have entered the OECD, for example, uh, that is where we're going to have to concentrate a lot of our discussions and our, uh, bring the creativity and bring a lot of the, the learnings from the last 10 years of climate action because we can do NDCs. We, can, we have done it. We were uh, one of the early countries that submitted a, a new NDC. We have a fossil free plan, one of the first ones in the developing world. It is there. And we know that Costa Rica can be fossil free. We don't produce oil, we don't produce cars. We can actually electrify transportation, which is our main problems and our main carbon problem and our main, um, it's a great opportunity for development. So the point is that even though we have done the homework 
even though the president is convinced, even though we have an amazing environment and energy minister, Andrea Mesa, we can't go to the next level with the fiscal model we have. We can't. And this is Costa Rica. I don't even want to think about Nigeria because, you know, it's, it's a bigger country and it has uh, other, other dynamics linked to oil. So my point is that going forward, I really would like our conversations to, yes, look at the NDCs and what they are doing, but we're going to have to create that space for the fiscal model. And then the other thing that, and we could talk for hours about that because I think this is coming up anyway, and we will, the concrete point in, in my view, at least for the countries that, I, that I'm more familiar with, for example, again, Costa Rica, Chile, Colombia, is that where we have the, the big uh, knot, you know, when you can't really unlock something, is in how the, how the economic debate is still monopolized by economists that are not taking the climate emergency seriously. That's the reality right now. And of course, there are very good things happening in the region, for example, the constitution in Chile, I think the fact they are going to bring the, the climate, um, you know, some, some climate dimension there is going to be quite uh, a moment for the region. So I'm not saying everything is lost, but I, my point is that I, I no longer feel comfortable just looking at the NDC from Costa Rica and, and re in grading uh, the future based on what it says there. The other point, and it's an observation about the way we tell the stories about countries and about change, is that if we ask the question of how we change, you know, like, why do we have a fossil free plan in Costa Rica? Did the president wake up one morning and say, I'm just going to have a fossil free plan? Why is it that we don't have a, a, an oil refinery with China? Why is it that we have a moratorium on oil and gas? or in oil, hopefully in gas soon. It's not because politicians just you know, make things happen because they want them to happen. You have a whole, a whole story of activism, very uncomfortable, especially in Latin America where activists get killed actually. And I don't see that being told. I don't see that being told in the stories we tell about how countries embrace their climate commitments. There is this kind of narrative of, there is a Paris Agreement, countries do an NDC, they do a long-term plan, there has to be consultations with stakeholders, and we go to COPs, and somehow this is how we change. And I am always thinking, why don't we mention NGOs and the, the work they do to lobby Congress and to lobby uh, politicians? Because if we don't do that, we are not being accurate about how we change and theories of change we need to understand all the levers and of course we need policy and markets and probably all these these cops but not necessarily i don't see necessarily that in the text so for example i'll give you a concrete example of costa rica the the actual case says costa rica has a law the congress passed a law on electric mobility is the first one in the region i i would i mean the story of how that law happened could be turned into a, a Netflix uh, documentary. <laughs> I look forward to it. So, so my point, Megan, is that I, I would encourage our researchers to, go a st to keep doing the great work they do, but I would encourage them to go a step farther and to be more explicit about how these milestones in policy happened. And the final point, and I, I will illustrate with transportation, is that right now, I'll put it in the, in the chat, right now there is a very, very important campaign taking place on transportation because we can accelerate the end of the internal combustion engine, the manufacturing. We can accelerate 20 years the end of, of that manufacturing. And, and, and there has been a lot of work there has been an agreement of about, I mean, this coalition will, will get to 100 partners this year, is global. And the point is, there has been a very valuable process from civil society coming together around very concrete targets. So for the leading markets, no more sales of, of, of petrol and diesel cars by 2035 or earlier in certain cities. For buses, 2030. For trucks 2040. And we have to 
think I know there is a sustainable mobility conversation taking place about biking and buses and all that, but we're not talking about cars. Let's not let's not trivialize electrification. We're talking about trucks, buses, the way we move food, the way we move everything. And my point is in the next five years, in the next five years, by 2060, if we reach a tipping point or when we reach the tipping point, we will have built a very good sequence from coal phase outs for electricity to ice phase outs. And my final point is that coming from Costa Rica and hearing Chuck and others, I know that if we don't take care of the global south, a lot of those ice cars are going to end up in you know, Central America or Nigeria or South Africa. And we don't want that. So my, my invitation to all of you is that now more than ever, we need the global south, especially the ones that don't produce cars and don't produce oil, like Costa Rica or Chile, is easier for us because we don't have the incumbency that you would have in other countries. So please join us. And I hope that even though we have bad news, terrible news, in fact, uh, in, in, in our countries, at least from that sectoral perspective, I'm actually quite... Uh, driven and quite um, more than driven, quite um, happy with the agency that I see in, in civil society and the victories in, in Europe um, recently in the Fit for 55 package. No more end, no, no end of sales by 2035 and some partial victories in the US. Not, we're not there yet with Biden, but we'll get there. Thank you. Okay, so there's really a lot to chew over there, Monica. Thank you so much. So I think the, the, the main takeaway is you, you can have all the sort of nice climate policies you like, but if the, the tax and spend uh, policy is not aligned, if it's dominated by uh, economists who uh, uh, don't understand natural capital um, or the climate crisis, uh, then um, then you, you're not going to succeed. And, and I think you, you sort of touched on answering the, the question we had about, um, you know, what are we doing? about the rich and their outsized carbon footprints um, and, uh, and yes you, you didn't have a, a, an example of anybody who is addressing that but um, but you, you do allude to well when uh, when politicians say they're going to tax the rich then they lose elections so there's a bit of an answer there maybe <laughs> maybe that's maybe one, I'm oversimplifying no 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 one one back. point that that is super important and, and Tasni mentioned and I, I have observed that in in our discussions in Latin America that at least at the governmental level level, we have lost the word justice in a lot of our debates. It's almost like, you know, you bring that up and it makes people uncomfortable around a technical round table. So I, I do think that that word needs to re-enter a lot of the conversations and it is re-entering because of the inequalities that are hitting our countries. Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. And um, uh, so we have one last speaker, Ayuba Sokona, um, last but certainly not least. Uh, Yuba is a uh, vice chair of the IPCC um, and uh, yeah, a, a great expert in, in clean energy um, and, and sustainable energy uh, development, um, particularly in Africa. So Yuba, uh, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, it's very hard to be the last speaker because I have nothing to say. They said everything. And you know, the easiest way will be to say that everything has been already said, but if I have been given the chance to be part of the conversation, let me just say a few things and I will be very short in order to have that conversation. I, I think that the, we said that in a deep decarbonization, uh, ambition is very important. And then we said that beyond the uh, emission number, beyond the numbers, emission numbers, I would say also in order to increase ambition, uh, going beyond words, slogans, and uh, you know, I, that's, I, we have seen the proliferation since we start discussing the climate issues. And then moving to actually everybody is talking about transformation and nobody knows how to do the transformation. Everybody is talking about just transition. Nobody knows how to do the just transition. It looked like we are in a completely different bubble. And I think that uh, we, uh, after this great uh, work that has been done, uh, coordinated by Idri, it's a first step uh, toward a long journey. And, and I think that there is 
at least two broad narratives we need to bring in. There's no one single narrative. It, will, it, it looks like it's dominated by one narrative, that is the climate narrative. And then we have at least two narratives, and then those two narratives do, should converge with the ambition. The first narrative is the development first narrative. And then the second narrative is the climate narrative. And then we need to bring those two together. If we start with the narrative, and everything that has been said, and uh, you know, Monica, you know, we are not there. And then this seemed to be very important and to have those two narratives and then converging and then with sustainability, making the, 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 those two converge. In that regard, it's very important not to say decarbonize, it's decarbonizing and decarbonize at the same time. Because in the second narrative, we need decarbonizing the economy. And then the development narrative, we need to have a decarbonized development path. And that seemed to be important and then not confusing, make the confusion between decarbonizing and decarbonized. And it's very important also that we are not restricting to emission reductions, it's as important as emission avoidance. Because you know, those two go together. We have the tendency only to look at the world as being part of a specific component, and that is where emissions are high, we need to reduce. At the same time, we need avoidance of emission and then to get those people, uh, Monica indicated, and then to jumpstart in the uh, carbon free economy. And it's very important also that, you know, uh, we, uh, the, to go beyond the cops, because the cops is converted people who are there anyway, it's a small fraction of people in the humanity are discussing things that is completely disconnected with the reality of the world because the transformation requires a wider participation. Transformation requires endurance. Transformation requires you know, commitment. It requires long-term perspective and that people, how to get people part of the process. Because if you focus on the COP, if you focus on numbers, and then we are not getting those processes. And then those are some of the elements I just wanted to bring to the conversation. And sorry to have nothing to say and then uh, to be uh, short also. Thank you. Thank you, Yuba. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, with the uh, 13 minutes we have left, um, I would like to invite all the panelists to turn your videos on and sort of wave if you want to respond to any of the points that have been raised by other speakers. Um, I would suggest there's been a really strong um, theme of, of sort of participation um, and I wanted to go back to Rodrigo because Chile was was about to host a COP. We um, uh, competed to to host a COP in Santiago um, when you had a you know social crisis. You had protests, um, and I'm really interested, Rodrigo, if you're there, and your video is not on. Um, but I, I'm really interested in um, sort of what that kind of triggered in terms of the discussion. Uh, you, you mentioned um, sort of. Um, redesigning the constitution um, and how how are you in Chile trying to um, uh, reconcile the, the desire for social justice and with the, the climate ambition? Are you there, Rodrigo? <laughs> Maybe I've chosen the wrong panelist to come back to. He's gone off and made a cup of tea. <laughs> All right. Scratch that. Um, <laughs> anyone would like to wave and respond to any to any of those uh, the points that have been raised? Tasneem. Yeah. No. Thanks, Megan. And I really want to express my appreciation for um, Monica's intervention and drawing very clearly, um, you know, the, the untold story. And that's exactly what I was intending to to offer in terms of understanding power and politics, right? And we often forget that in fact, power to change things and especially big and deep and meaningful change does come through the power of people. We often forget that. And so we relegate the power of people into these kind of, oh, you know, these, these referral pressure group types of, 
uh, people. They're just an irritant. They, they can be dismissed at will. But a big change in our world and in our history has come through the power of people. And I say that because I've literally experienced that in my own country, South Africa. So that story that Monica says needs to be told, I think is, and I think other speakers like Yuba and others have also alluded to this, it's that story that should be built into this conversation about change, about deep decarbonization. And I like what Yuba says about deep uh, decarbon development pathways, because those two conversations are not there's been progress, I would say, Yuba, but, you know, it hasn't merged and many countries still consider them as, as um, mutually exclusive. And so I think we also need to get better at that, but totally love the point that Monica made about the untold stories. These, these big victories or little victories come at great cost. And I don't think that's valued enough at all in any of our work. And, and can I talk about people power in, in respect of the COP? I mean, as Yuba says, the COP is not um, the be all and end all, but it is a microcosm of these, these uh, international climate tensions. Um, Tasneem and, and Khan have, have said it's not possible for the COP to go ahead equitably in November and that it should be postponed. Um, can I ask the speakers to be a bit brave and, and let's have a show of hands. Who thinks that the COP, the COP26 should go ahead in November? Raise your hands. Nobody. You, none of you have booked tickets? None of you are, are coming? OK, OK, let me ask the question differently. Who has booked tickets to Glasgow in November? The, the problem is not to have a ticket for Glasgow in November. We may be there. And then the problem is that what can we achieve in Glasgow? And then it's an evidence that a large part of the people who should be there will not be there. And then because we have, we are not controlling the pandemic. And then this is an obvious uh, issue. What can we achieve? It, is it just to have a cup for a cup? Or do we have really, and then to increase the level of our ambitions? And then how we go beyond the cups? Because it's, it's converted people who will be there anyway, discussing among themselves, sharing the same view, the same things. Because the problem of ambition is nothing about that. It's about how to get over being part of the process. How in Mali, how in Costa Rica, how in South Africa, how in the US, and then those who are not talking about the climate integrate the climate in their daily business. And then this is really where we will get real ambition toward where we need to lead. The problem is not to have emission reduction. The problem is to have a well-being of the people in a much more safer manner. Yeah, so I mean, if if um, if nobody else wants to uh, to 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 make the sort of case for having the COP, Amit, you want to say something? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there are two things important. First is what Yuba said, and this project has done sustainable development and climate change are the two sides of the same coin, which which uh, we have been trying to do. You meet one, then fifty percent of the other are is met. That is. Uh, our work. The second thing is rather than in COP26, rather than looking at others and trying to point out fingers, please remember when you point a finger at somebody else, three put fingers point at you. So we have to be very, very careful in finding out what we can do, what we bring to the table. Without that, it is not possible. No, we can just go on doing what we have been doing for the last 25 years. Uh, we have to be very careful. As Tasneem said, uh, people have to be brought in this whole game. Businesses have to be brought in this whole game. Then things move. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, just to, I, I guess the, the, the main function of the COP is almost is as a real deadline for countries to submit their NDCs, right? And there have been lots of attempts to, to set, uh, you know, other deadlines, UN's tried to set deadlines, and a lot of countries, have, big emitters have ignored them. So I, I guess the question is, if it's not the COP um, that gives them the impetus to finally do their homework, then, then what is the, the mechanism for, for accountability? Accountability for whom? That is very important. Accountability David is raised his hand. David, David, chime in. Yes. 
I mean, I, first, I think these are really important questions around the COP, but I think the question maybe for this webinar is a slightly different one, right? Which is, this is about bottom-up approaches. And so I think the question is, how do we um, really take that dimension seriously in terms of um, the social and equity issues that, that have been spoken about? I do think there will be some questions down the line with the um, Paris Agreement, the global stock take, for example, how does it get outside of the UNFCCC bubble? Are there ways that it actually can tap into um, the kind of people power, the kind of transformational sectoral action that's underway um, at the country level? So there are those questions, but I think you know the, the, the other question at hand is really, what does that transformation look like um, in, in the country context, in the local context? And, one thing I just wanted to note is I think this question about deep development is applicable. Obviously, there are really key issues in developing countries, but I think in some ways it's applicable as well to developed countries. And just thinking about the US right now, for example, um, we have proposals around how do you invest in climate action in disadvantaged communities? How do you generate jobs for those who need jobs with, with climate action? Um, and in fact, one of the key questions before Congress right now is, are we gonna have a fair tax system that actually generates the resources to be able to invest? And right now we have a number of businesses that on the one hand say they're for a very strong NDC target, and on the other hand are resisting the kind of um, taxes we need uh, in the congressional legislation. So these are the kind of questions where I think actually sort of equitable, sustainable development issues come to a head in, in developed countries as well. Okay, but we do have another question from the audience. Um, let's try and answer while we're here. So Antoine Portanguen um, has asked um, about uh, a question about carbon accounting. So the NDC's targets are based on production of greenhouse gas emissions within national boundaries. Um, do you on the panel think it would be best to also control the imports of greenhouse gases? So this is uh, consumption-based emissions, the, the emissions associated with your import, imported products. Um, and, and would that, how would that change the dynamics? Does anyone have a view on that? Bit more of a technical question. Amit? Yeah, this uh, consumption-based estimates are a tricky issue. Are a tricky issue because then China will not remain the largest contributor to greenhouse gases because that is production-based accounting. Rather, I think uh, USA, Europe, and other countries. So it is a very tricky issue. And uh, pardon me for saying that US already, uh, EU started a border taxation. This is going to open the Pandora's box. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Marta. No, make it just to add also, I mean, be, beyond the way it is, um, be, beyond kind of the rules we have from these accountability frameworks, which are very important. But I mean, that, that I think that in the way that um, deep decarbonization is explored, it is already embedded. We're looking at supply and demand. We're looking at value change across borders. So we indeed, more and more, we find um, ourselves moving away from, from the structure, let's say that the GAG inventory, you know, would naturally kind of drive us to do those analysis. So, so definitely uh, um, do this is the, the, the way forward in, in the way we, we look at the transformations. So um, yeah, just make that point. And Monica. Monica. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not about the exactly the question, but it's, it, it triggered this point in, in my head. Uh, one of the things that we really need to work on in the next in the next year, in the next five years, is this is this reality of double standards. Um, it's really shocking to me, even though I know this happened, but it's still very shocking to me how we built a world that allows certain companies to do certain things in certain markets and then have a board that knowingly approves a business strategy with polluting technologies with the same brand in a different geography. I mean, if somebody came from another galaxy and we have to explain this to that person, that person would say, well, why would you do that? Once you develop the zero emission technology, we need to leapfrog, we need to do that. And, and I think that 
rather than getting into the accounting of the carbon, which I think is probably, uh, there would be a community that would, be, would do that. I, I would really want them to pick up in a different panel this notion of, of the double standards that is, is there and is, is delaying the transition big time and killing people. Okay, um, so I think um, Tasneem is ready, raising her hand, but we have one minute left. So I'm just, I think I'm just going to wrap up. But I think that was an interesting kind of technical question around consumption-based accounting or versus production-based. But but actually, I think that the, the point of this um, report is that um, it's more, uh, that's not necessarily, let's not like get obsessed about the, the carbon accounting. Let's look at the, the, the way that the, progress or lack of it in particular sectors and it like plays into national policy making. Um, so I think one of the key themes that's come out of this is that that, that tax and spend is really important and the, the way um, our sort of fiscal frameworks are designed is, is really important. Um, and uh, yeah, there are some various other more, uh, ju that justice is really important, that participation is really important, that activists um, can, can really make a difference on this. So I think we've had lots of wonderful contributions from all our panelists um, and I would like to thank you all for coming um, all of you who, who stuck it out to the end um, and I hope you you got uh, got a lot out of it the report is available uh, the link is in the chat um, and I, I imagine will be emailed afterwards um, so, so thank you all for coming and I'll say goodbye now <laughs>